Hi, I'm Anna, and if you're new here, welcome to my channel, where we explore folklore, mythology, myths, legends, and fairy tales every week. And if you're a returning subscriber, welcome back. Today we're going to look into the Scandinavian Christmas or winter tradition known as the Yule Goat. Let's get started. The Yule Goat goes by a number of different but similar names across Scandinavia. In Norway, it's known as Julebuk, or Julejegt, which both mean the Yule Goat. In Sweden, the names are similar, called the Julebuk, or Julegunds. And in Danish, it's known as Julebuk, or Julegett, which are all very similar. All of these names translate directly to the Yule Goat. However, Yule is also the name given to Christmas in the modern day, so it can also be called the Christmas Goat. In some regions, it's also referred to as the New Year's Goat, or Nytorsbu. And this is because the traditions surrounding the Yule Goat are most commonly played out between Christmas time and New Year. Today we'll be focusing on the Scandinavian stories and traditions of the Yule Goat. However, there are similar traditions and practices that can be found all across Europe, especially Northern Europe. Today, the most common usage of the Yule Goat, and where you're likely to see it most, is as a Christmas ornament. These are typically made of straw, folded into the shape of a goat, and bound with red string or ribbon. These are often hung on the Christmas tree, around the house, or are left standing by doorways and as decorations. Every year in the city of Jävle in Sweden, a giant version of this ornament is constructed out of hay and red ribbon or decorations. This tradition has also created a newer tradition in which people try to burn the monument down every year, or otherwise destroy it. Despite being very illegal and even carrying a short prison sentence of a few months, this too has become a tradition. This tradition has gone on for 55 years, and 55 giant Yule Goats have been constructed every year. However, only 18 of those years was the goat left standing by the end of Christmas. And as of filming this video, the goat is still standing. But there's still a few weeks left until Christmas. So who knows what will happen. Hi everyone, it's Editing Anna here. I did just check and the goat in Yevle was actually burnt down last night, which was the 16th of December during the evening. So. Yeah, I guess uh, a lot can happen in a few days between recording a video and releasing it. But I guess there's always next year. But how did the goat become associated with Christmas time? Or Yule? Or even winter? Well, the goat has played an important and significant role in the beliefs of the Scandinavian people for many, many years. In Viking times, the goat was strongly associated with the Norse god Thor, who was believed to own two goats by the name of Tangrisnir and Tangnoster, meaning teeth thin and teeth grinder. These goats are known to pull his chariot, and one of the best known stories of his goats comes from Yulfagani, from the Prose Edda, that tells of how one of Thor's goats got his limp. As the story goes, Thor stops by a farmer's house and he slaughters his goats for supper. They sit down to eat with the farmer, his wife, and his son and his daughter, and they serve the meat for dinner. Then Thor lays the goat hides far from the fire and tells the father and his servants that they should cast the bones onto the goat hide. The farmer's son was holding a thigh bone of one of the goats, and he split it with his knife, and broke it to eat the marrow. Thor stayed there overnight, 
and in the early hours of the morning, before the sun rose up, he got dressed, took the hammer Mjölnir, and swung it up, and hallowed the goat hides. Straight away the goats rose up, resurrected, but one of them was lame in their hind leg. Thor discovered this, and declared that the farmer or his household had not dealt wisely with the bones of the goat, and he knew that the thigh bone had been broken. The farmer threw himself down before the god's anger, and Thor clenched his hands on the hammer shaft so that the knuckles were whitened, and the farmer and all his household did what was to be expected. They cried out lustily, praying for peace, offered in recompense all that they had. But when he saw their terror, the fury departed from him, and he became appeased. But he took of them in atonement their children, who then became his bond servants, and they followed him ever since. It was thought that the worship of the goat, or using the imagery of the goat, may have come from the worship or reverence of the god Thor. And it highlights the importance of the goat to the pre-Christian Nordic people. Heidrun is the name of a goat in Norse mythology that's said to live at Valhalla and sit on top and eat the leaves of a tree that grows there. She eats the leaves and creates a wonderful mead in her udder which then flows down into a great cauldron or bowl. From this bowl, the Einherjad, the fallen Viking warriors that prepare to face Ragnarok with Odin, drink the mead and feast every day. She's mentioned also in Yilfagini. The she-goat, she who is called Heidrun, stands up in Valhall and bites the needles from the limb of that tree, which is very famous, and is called Lerater. And from her udders, mead runs so copiously that she fills a tun every day. That tun is so great that all the champions become quite drunk from it. Whilst these are three examples of named goats within Norse mythology, the texts and sources that we have, particularly the Eddas, have countless references to goats, especially in daily life. The goat would have been an important source of food for the Nordic people, both through meat as well as milk, especially during the cold, harsh winters, when not a lot of plant foods would have been available. The goat was also a common sacrificial animal that would be slaughtered and then often feasted upon in worship of the gods. It was thought that the modern tradition of the Yule goat may have come from the sacrificial goat that was slaughtered for the gods during pre-Christian winter celebrations to ensure prosperity in the upcoming year. There's another old tradition surrounding the Yule Goat, which likely has roots in pagan or pre-Christian traditions. This is known as Yule Booking, or Christmas Goating, or Yule Goating, to give somewhat of a translation. Now this is similar to the Wesailing, or the Mary Lloyd, that we would see in Wales or in England. A bit like trick-or-treating or Christmas caroling, even. And it may be the origin, or one of the origins, of these more modern practices. In the time between Christmas and New Year's, people would dress up in costumes and masks, concealing their identity, and then go from one house to another to all of their neighbours. It was the neighbour's job to try and find out who was visiting them, and who it was under each disguise. Often, the Yulebukis would change their voices and walk differently, or otherwise change their body language to make it even more difficult to identify them. It was also said that in some regions, the Yulebukis would speak with a sort of nonsensical language and make their voices sound strange, 
like trolls or nisses. And they would make up a sort of magical language to further add to their identities. Once the mysterious visitors had been properly identified, they would often eat or drink together with the household and then move on to the next home. Traditionally, Yule booking was thought to be a pagan practice, perhaps to honor Thor, and people would wear goat skins and go from house to house carrying a goat head or skull. During the Christianization of Scandinavia, the practice of Yule booking was changed. And throughout Scandinavia, there are plenty of regional variations on the tradition. It was said that once the group had visited a household and been identified and then ate and drunk with the residents, that at least one person from that household had to get dressed up and join them. As you can see, throughout the night, the group would have gotten much, much bigger until at the end there was quite a party to be had. It's said that because the group would get very loud and rowdy, especially as more drinks and food were consumed and more people from each household joined them, that this tradition may have a connection to the wild hunt. It was tradition in most places for each person of the group to get an alcoholic drink, and if there were children there, they would get some sort of sweet or candy. As the night went on and the group got bigger and bigger and much more rowdy, it's not hard to see how this could be mistaken for a group of rowdy trolls or supernatural creatures. Perhaps the idea that the group was supernatural was used to scare children into staying inside in the wintertime or to stay inside and sleep while everyone else went out and partied. During the 1800s, the Yule Goat adopted the role of the Christmas gift giver across Scandinavia as well as in Finland. In fact, in Finland, the modern word used for Santa Claus actually translates directly to the Yule Goat still today. Unfortunately, the Yule Goat was replaced by the Yule Nissa or Tomta, the small gnome-like creature that most of us know about. However, this today is also starting to be replaced by Santa Claus, as with many other European traditional Christmas gift givers. However, the words used for Santa Claus are still the more traditional Yule Nissa or Yule Tomta in Norway and Sweden and many still keep the older tradition of the small gnome-like creature alive today. The Yule Goat may be the oldest winter, Christmas or Yule symbol that still persists today across Scandinavia. However, the traditions associated with the goat have changed countless times throughout history, with roots in old pagan practices and likely connections to the Viking god Thor. The Yule Goat plays an integral role within old traditional Christmas and wintertime practices of the Nordic people, which, unfortunately, are now being lost as fewer people partake in them each year. That was today's video on the Yule Book, or the Yule Goat, or Christmas Goat, from across Scandinavia. I hope you enjoyed it. But for now, stay safe, stay warm and cozy, and have a wonderful Christmas, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye! I'd like to take a moment to say a big thank you to the members of the channel, as well as my patrons on Patreon, for supporting my work. Folklore and fairy tales play such a big part in my life, and I love being able to share them here with you. If you're interested in finding out more about channel membership, you can find all the information here or in the link in the video description. Or you can head over to my Patreon page. You can find the link in the description of this video or on my YouTube homepage. Thanks for watching and thanks again to the members of the channel and my patrons for your support. 
But for now, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video.